everyone. Um, my name is Dan Eilerman, Assistant County Administrator for the County of Marin, and welcome to our informal workshop um, regarding redistricting in the County of Marin. So um, we're hoping this is going to be a really helpful process for um, everyone. Um, today's workshop is really an opportunity to provide the public information, and I am going to take my mask off so you can um, hear me a little bit better. Um, for those in the room, um, our panel is fully vaccinated. You know, we've discussed that in advance and you may see us taking our mask off while we speak, you know, just so that members remotely can, um, you know, hear us speak a little bit better. But um, today's workshop is really an opportunity to provide the public information about the Marin County redistricting process, uh, to also discuss guidelines and criteria associated with that process. and. Um, I think probably most importantly to introduce our newly launched online um, BAMIC tools, and these will be for um, the public to use. Um, they're available online today as we speak, um, and we'll be talking about um, some other things today. Um, I do uh, want to note we have um, several members of the public in the audience today as well. This is our first hybrid meeting um, for the County of Marin, um, so we are uh, remote as well as live in um, Marin County Board of Supervisor Chambers. This is not a um, formal um, Board of Supervisor meeting. We do have um, two supervisor members in the audience, as I mentioned, Supervisor Dennis Redoni in uh, District 4 and also Supervisor Damon Connolly, District 1. So we welcome members live in the audience as well as those on Zoom today. Um, I am going to introduce um, Chris Scannell from Nielsen Merksimer, um, one of our contracted resources to really help us um, and advise us on the complicated um, legal statutory framework around the statutory or the um, redistricting process. And um, after Chris um, presents and introduces himself this morning, I'm also going to introduce Kristen Park. Kristen Parks of NDC um, uh, to my right on the panel is our um, demographer who's helping us with all this process as well. And then to my immediate right is um, Anna Giles. Um, she is a strategic project manager for the County of Marin and has really done all the organization work around um, today's um, informal meeting. So um, with that, I think first I am going to turn it over to um, Chris Gannell to briefly introduce himself and then we'll subsequently introduce Kristen. Um, so Chris, with that, feel free to introduce yourself and say a few words. All right, thanks Dan, thanks for having me. Um, a little bit about me and our firm. Uh, Nielsen Merksimer is based here in Marin County uh, over in San Rafael. We've been here for, for several decades, uh, but we practice voting rights and redistricting law all up and down the state. It's one of our specialties and has been for decades as well. Um, I have to say it's nice to, to be doing something close to home. Uh, here in Marin and, and working with the county. Well, thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure working with you the last few months, and um, I'm also going to ask Kristen Parks of NDC to say a few words about herself. Good morning. Thank you, Dan. My name is Kristen Parks. I'm a consultant with National Demographics Corporation. We are your demographer team, which means that we are the mapping experts. So my primary role today will be to introduce you to the mapping tools that we have made available to the public and we encourage your participation. So I'm looking forward to demonstrating these for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then finally, among our panel members, I want to introduce um, Anna Giles, our strategic projects manager. And Anna, anything you want to say um, about yourself? Well, thank you very much, Anna and panel. Um, so hopefully this is going to be a fun process for everybody today. We are really looking at this as an informal process. We want it to be more of a conversational, um, informal process where members of the public feel comfortable to ask questions that maybe they wouldn't feel ordinarily comfortable asking in a formal Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, this uh, meeting today is going to be really broken up into three parts. Um, First, we are going to begin with Chris Scannell, who is going to present on the background of the redistricting process and guidelines um, and structure um, with regard to the whole redistricting process and how that works. And after that presentation, there's going to be time for some question and answers from members of the public. 
um, both um, those who are tuning in remotely on Zoom and also those in the audience today. And then after that, um, we will go to Kristen Parks, who is going to conduct a live demonstration of some of our public mapping tools um, that are going to be available for the public to um, draw their own communities of interest as they see them. Um, that will be an important part of um, the public information that we've received that informs the whole process. Um, and then we will have a chance um, at the conclusion of today's um, formal um, part of the presentation for members of the public who are in chambers today to really have some hands-on experience with the online mapping tools. So for those who are on site today, we have a few laptop stations set up and Kristen Parks will kind of walk through how to use the tools and um, that ought to be a fun and informative part of what we're going to do this morning as well. So again, I mentioned earlier, today's um, workshop is a hybrid workshop. Um, we do thank those in the audience who are um, wearing their masks in, in accordance with our um, public health officer orders. And um, again, the members of the panel, when we speak, um, just so that we can be as accessible as possible, we are going to take off our masks um, while we speak. Um, a recording of this workshop upon its conclusion will be made available and it will be posted publicly on our redistricting workshop or our, our work, um, work site um, um, uh, public web space. Um, for those tuning in through Zoom, the workshop is um, simultaneously translated today in both Spanish and Vietnamese. So if you would like to use the translation services, um, all you need to do is select the language button at the bottom of your screen if you're online today and select your preferred language. So with that is hopefully a very brief introductory process as to how we expect the next couple hours to go. I think what I would like to do is to turn it over to Chris Cannell who will present on some background with regard to the redistricting process. So Chris, feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm going to... I have a PowerPoint here that I'm going to walk through a little bit, and the primary focus of it is going to be the rules that govern the actual drawing of maps and the, the criteria that are required to be taken into consideration. But I thought I would start very briefly first with a little bit about the process that we're going to be going through. So you have here on the, the first slide um, the key dates that we're looking at as part of this process. Uh, the, the sort of... Uh, most important date ultimately is December 15th. That is the, the no, I'm not, not getting the, okay. Uh, December 15th, which is the deadline in the elections code for the county to adopt the final map uh, for use beginning next June's elections. Uh, and so everything else is sort of working backwards from that. Um, the other key um, sort of starting point, key milestone in all of this is the release of the census data. Um, some folks may have heard that the Census Bureau released the initial data uh, on August 12th, uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, that was about four and a half months later than they were supposed to under statute, but you know, like everything else, they were affected by the pandemic. And so the initial data have been released, and we'll talk a little bit about them, um, but that's not sort of the end of the story because under California law, um, the county is required to use adjusted data. The California Statewide Database at UC Berkeley is in the process of taking those census data and making adjustments for um, incarcerated persons who are supposed to be taken out of the, the population base. And so we're anticipating that those adjusted data are going to be available sometime mid to late September. And that's when the, the line drawing process can really start to, to focus. But in the meantime, we're really, you know, primarily focused on getting feedback from the public about the current districts and possible changes and what people think they need to be taking into account uh, with respect to their communities. And so the first uh, public hearing that we're anticipating is going to be October 12th. Uh, and under the, the formal statutes, there have to be at least four public hearings. Uh, and so the first will be October 12th, uh, the, not including today's as, as one of the four. Um, and then during the, as we said, early to mid-October, but now it's a little bit earlier um, time frame, we're anticipating getting those census data out. And then there will be an October 26th board meeting, uh, a public hearing. And that's when we'll actually start to see proposed maps from Kristen and her team um, for people to start to comment on. Um, and 
at that point, that'll be the second public hearing. And then the third and fourth will be November 9th and December 7th. And those will really be more opportunities for the board to get feedback from the public about the proposed maps, you know, which ones they do like, which ones they don't like, which ones could maybe work with modest changes, et cetera. Uh, and so the, the goal is for the board to adopt a final plan December 7th because that's the last uh, board meeting before that December 15th timeline. Um, one other thing before I get to the criteria that I want to put in a brief plug for, I think Dan already may have mentioned it, um, is in terms of information, uh, the county has a website, redistrictmarin.org. It's one-stop shopping for all the information you could possibly need about this process. Um, it's got timeline. It's going to have all copies of all the draft maps when they start to come out. It has the mapping links to the mapping tools that Kristen's going to talk about. It has agendas. It has everything. And anything related to this process will be available on that website. Um, so if you have questions, that's a, a good place to start. And so now turning to the, uh, the criteria that guide the, the line drawing process. Uh, what we're going to cover today is three, three categories. Um, first, federal law, which is really sort of um, the most important thing. Obviously, federal law is supreme over everything else, um, but it really sets just sort of some outer guidelines. And we're going to talk about what those are, the most important being equal population, which is why we do this, um, and the others being the Voting Rights Act and relatedly some restrictions on uh, racial gerrymandering. Within those outer boundaries set by federal law, um, everything else is filled in really by state law. And there have been some recent changes in the last few years to the state statutes. It used to be that uh, county boards of supervisors had pretty much unbounded discretion in drawing the boundary lines. Um, that's really changed with the adoption of the Fair Maps Act in 2019. And so now we have very specific criteria that have to be taken into account in a very specific order. They're listed here and we'll, we'll talk about them a little further. Um, and then within that um, sort of constraint, within the, the requirement that these five criteria be complied with, there's also potentially some room for some other traditional criteria that have generally been considered in the process, provided that when those are taken into account, it doesn't lead then to a violation of those statutory criteria in that blue box. And so that's, that's sort of the hierarchy of the rules and how they, they fit together. And I'm going to walk briefly through them. Um, as I said, population equality is the single most important thing. It's why we do redistricting every 10 years. Uh, dating back to the early 60s, the Supreme Court has said that a jurisdiction that uses district-based elections has to periodically uh, review those districts and make sure that they're roughly equal in population. And when they say periodically, they've said at least every 10 years. And so most states do it in the year following the census, understandably, and, s and California has adopted statutes to that effect. Um, and when we say substantial equality in population, um, that doesn't mean it has to be perfect equality, right? Congressional districts have to be pretty close to perfect. Um, but every other type of district it has a little bit more play in the joints. And so the, the court, Supreme Court and lower courts have said that as long as you're doing it for some, you know, generally reasonable, valid governmental reason, there can be some, some wiggle room within that, that constraint. Um, and what they've said generally is that you know, as long as the districts are, the total plan deviation of the districts is within 10%, and we'll talk about what that means, then it's presumptively constitutional, it's presumptively valid. It doesn't mean it can never be challenged, but it is pretty difficult if you're within that 10%. And so I thought very briefly, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but I, I would talk about how that 10% is calculated. Um, the way it works is you take the total population of the, the jurisdiction, and, and I should mentioned that the numbers here are not for Marin County. This is just an, a hypothetical example. Um, but you take the total population, and that's what you have in that red circle there, and you divide it by the number of seats. So in this example and in Marin County, it's five seats. And that gives you an ideal population. And then what you do is you take the population of the largest district and the population of the smallest district, and you figure out the difference between the two. Um, and you d then divide that difference, that that deviation by the ideal number um, of, of the district, and that tells you what your percentage deviation is. And if it's under 10, as I said, it's presumptively valid. If it's over 10, um, it's presumptively invalid. And uh, you know, truthfully, at this point, the courts are almost never going to uphold anything over 10. Uh, certainly in a, a jurisdiction this size, there's no reason for us to be there. 
Um, there's also a little bit of a quirk. Traditionally, those, those equal population numbers have been based off of total population, the numbers released by the Census Bureau. Uh, but the courts have said that states and are allowed to make some adjustments as long as it's done properly. And California has adopted a statute that requires that counties take into account um, uh, incarcerated persons, uh, meaning that they are taken out of the population base. And as I said, that's being worked on at, by the statewide database. Um, basically what the, the legislature has said is that anybody who is incarcerated in a state facility uh, doesn't get counted in the total population unless they can be reassigned back to their last known place of residence outside of the, the uh, institution. Um, what does that mean for Marin County? The big, the big effect of that is that San Quentin gets taken out of the population base. Historically, it's been included. Um, counties have always had the discretion in the past to either count it or not. Um, there's also a potentially much smaller impact of uh, prisoners from throughout the state being reassigned to various places throughout Marin County. Probably that's going to have a pretty minimal impact. It might be a few people per census block. Mm -hmm. So it's really San Quentin that's going to be the big piece there. And so we do have, based on the uh, census data that were released about a week ago, some preliminary numbers. Again, these are going to be subject to a little bit of change. Uh, first of all, from the prisoners being reassigned. Uh, second of all, because um, I, I crunch these numbers and uh, the, the county's current districts don't perfectly match up with the census boundaries. Um, and so, you know, depending on how you, you make those splits, it might change things, you know, a tenth of a point here or whatever. And that'll, that'll be Kristen and her team that make those final calls. But these should be pretty close to the final. Um, and this does exclude the San Quentin population here. And what you can see is that the, the big um, piece here is that because San Quentin is removed, District 4 is now pretty substantially underpopulated. It's al almost 6% under the ideal. And then the, uh, the rest of the districts are all uh, a little bit over, ranging anywhere from just barely over. You know, District 5 is uh, less than half a point over to just under 3% in District 1 and 1.5% and in District 2. Um, so, you know, the bottom line here is the county is under 10%. It's within that 10% threshold. Um, we thought based on earlier population estimates that it would be over. Um, those estimates ended up be having some difference from the final census numbers for, for various reasons. Um, in past decades, being within that 10%, uh, that might have been the end of the story. Um, but because of the changes to state law and the Fair Maps Act that were adopted, um, it's still important and required for us to go through the entire process of holding all of those hearings and getting feedback from the public on these maps um, to, to see if there are any changes that still might be required to meet those statutory criteria. Uh, but this is a good first step. We, we know that we're, we're probably within that 10% to start, and that's, that's helpful. So the next piece of... Uh, federal law, as I mentioned, is the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, it, you know, is the most important thing after equal population. It's more important than any of the state criteria. And basically, the way it works is Section 2 of the Act um, prohibits any electoral practice at all, but that includes districts, that would dilute the voting power, the equal opportunity of minority voters to nominate and elect candidates of their choice. Um, that includes racial minorities, as defined by the Census Bureau, and also language minorities, which includes Spanish-speaking people, um, which is, you know, has a significant impact in California for the, the Latino population. Um, a key point, though, is that the, the Supreme Court has held that the Federal Voting Rights Act only really comes into play if it's possible to draw a district in which those minority voters, those, that group, um, can be a majority meaning 50% plus one of the voting age, or citizen voting age population within a single district. And so, um, well, I'll come back to this in just a second. Uh, in, in Marin County, given the population numbers, um, the most uh, significant of the, the groups that would potentially be affected is Latino citizen voting age population. Um, in none of the current districts is there a, a group that's anywhere near 50%. Um, and there's really no way to draw any configuration of the lines that would get near 50%. And so, you know, the, the Federal Voting Rights Act is not going to drive, per se, the, the drawing of these district lines, um, which gets back to the, the slide I was at before. 
Um, the other piece of federal law that comes into, into play in this is, you know, the Voting Rights Act requires that we pay attention to race uh, and, and, you know, where the racial groups within any jurisdiction live. Um, but the court has also set some limits on that, and they, they've held that the 14th Amendment um, s means that you cannot use race as the predominant consideration in drawing lines. Um, unless the Voting Rights Act requires it, which, as we just said, is not likely to be the case. And so um, the bottom line is that even, even within that constraint, racial considerations can be taken into account, but it needs to be, you know, because the court recognizes that nobody's going to be completely oblivious to that. Um, but it needs to be uh, just part of the mix. You know, it, you take, it, it, the court has said that, you know, that can't require you to completely ignore all the other traditional criteria. And so, you know, it might be that the, uh, a, a given racial group is a community of interest and, you know, has, has a role, but, but it can't be the overarching uh, reason that you're drawing specific lines. The, the best approach, given that the Voting Rights Act isn't going to require anything, is really to focus more on the communities of interest within your district and, and have that be the, the focus of the process. So that's the federal law. As I said, it's the outer boundaries. And everything within that um, outer boundary is really uh, set by state law. And so the state law, I, I mentioned before, it used to be that state law didn't really set much of anything. You know, county boards of supervisors had pretty much unfettered discretion to draw district lines that made sense um, and to balance criteria or considerations any way they saw fit. As of 2019, that's not true anymore. Um, now, due to the Fair Maps Act, there are a list of criteria that are mandatory. Uh, it used to be that you could take things into account or not. Um, and they're ranked in order of priority. And so they're listed here in order. The top one is contiguity. Um, not usually too difficult uh, and fairly self-explanatory. Um, the second most important is minimizing the division of neighborhoods and communities of interest to the extent practicable. Um, and we'll talk about what that means because that's a little bit less intuitive. Third behind that criterion is minimizing the division of cities and census designated places. Census designated places are basically any sort of um, unincorporated but still um, understandable or recognizable uh, jurisdiction within a, a county that um, the Census Bureau recognizes as having kind of recognizable concrete boundaries. And so they, they produce a file that not only includes the populations of cities, but also includes the, pop the populations and boundaries for these census-designated places. Um, the fourth, most important, is easily identifiable and understandable boundaries. And so that would be things like streets. Um, highways, rivers, um, mountain ranges, um, you know, county boundaries, et cetera. Things that people can look at and understand as the natural boundary of the district that they live in and vote in. And then the fifth most important, um, you know, subordinate to the rest is the compactness, not of the district per se, but of the population that lives within it. So you don't go bypassing huge swaths of people to get to a much more distant uh, population center. There's also, uh, you know, in, in the statute, a prohibition on sort of partisan gerrymandering. What the, what the language actually says is that relationships with incumbent members and political parties are not a community of interest. I, in the context of a nonpartisan office, I'm not, it doesn't generally come into play all that much, but it, it is part of the statute, so I mentioned it there. And so, as, as I mentioned, communities of interest is, is the second most important criterion, and it's also the least sort of intuitive or, or obvious what that means. The state law has a definition, which is any population that shares common social or economic interests that should be included within a single district for purposes of its effective and fair representation. So what does that mean? You know, uh, lifestyle considerations, you know, your community character, uh, recreation or shared social gatherings, economic considerations, you know, uh, people in a certain area work in a common industry or have, you know, work in a, a certain commercial area, that sort of thing. Could be demographics, you know, race, income, education, although you see the, the asterisk on race, we talked about the limitations there and, and why we should be careful about that. Um, geographic considerations, um, political subdivisions, you know, other than the cities and CDPs. Um, but bottom line is, it could be just about anything, you know, and, and really it's gonna be a subjective issue. 
you know, it varies jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and it depends on where people live, what they think their communities are. Um, and so it could be homeowners associations. It could be people who focus on, uh, you know, their local dog park. Um, you know, one example I've always liked is in the city of Phoenix a decade ago, there were some, a, a group of people in their downtown area who owned a bunch of historic brick homes. And they felt like they had a, a common political interest in how the city council treated those brick homes um, as part of the planning process. So they came in and said, hey, we want to be kept together um, as part of the redistricting process. And, and the council did keep them together. So it can be pretty far ranging. It can be pretty, pretty broad. It's whatever people think of their community of interest being. And so, you know, so I won't walk through all of these, but here's a, a, a list of some examples from the testimony that the, the state commission um, received 10 years ago when they were drawing the, the state lines. Um, and I should say that, you know, these are pretty broad, some of them. How specific or general a community of interest is may vary depending on the jurisdiction. You know, the state of California has 40 million people. So, you know, the, the communities of interest there may be very general and, and broad uh, because you're talking about a lot of population, a lot of territory. In a, a smaller community like a county or, you know, it's the smaller you get, it may become more specific. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, something to, to consider. As I said, I won't read through all of these, but this is available online for people who are interested. But bottom line is because it's so subjective and so jurisdiction specific, what we really need is information from the community on what the communities of interest are. I mean, obviously the Board of Supervisors knows their community. We're gonna be relying on information from, from them uh, naturally, but we want people to come out and tell us what's your community, what's your community of interest that should be taken into account in the process. You know, we can look at demographic data, we can look at, you know, like planning maps and that sort of thing, but the most important factor in all of this, what we're looking for is testimony from the community. Um, and we want it, I should say, we, we, we need it to be specific. You know, in the past, because this wasn't a, a mandatory criteria, sometimes we would get people who would come in and they would make very general comments about their community of interest or, you know, even more general, just kind of do a good job. What we need is something that's concrete enough to be actionable. And so that means tell us what your community of interest is, certainly. Also tell us where it is. You know, we need to be able to put it on a map at this point to be able to take it into account. And so, you know, um, having roads that bound it or, um, you know, mountain ranges or whatever it is so that it's, it's a concrete fixed area so that national demographics can actually put it on a map and understand whether we're dividing it or not is going to be important. And so that's what we're really looking for. And there are lots of ways to, to provide that feedback. There's coming to, uh, you know, the public hearings or, you know, providing comments on Zoom. Um, there, you can provide written uh, suggestions through the website. Uh, or through any other medium for that matter. Um, Kristen's also going to talk about the mapping tools. That's a, a useful way to provide con that concrete uh, information that we were talking about. So that's really what we're looking for from the public is to come in and give us that feedback because you, you all know your community better than we do. Again, I, we'll, I won't spend a lot of time on this either because Kristen's going to talk about it, but those, those mapping tools really are a valuable way to do this. So those are kind of, uh, we talked about the, the mandatory statutory criteria and the, the ranking that they have to be applied in. Um, as I said, there were some traditional criteria that historically the courts have thought were valid and legitimate. Um, I think they still have a role in this process, even though they're not listed in the statute. Um, where they're gonna come into play though is when you're making choices within those criteria. A and what I mean by that is, for example, the, the statute said you have to minimize the division of communities of interest to the extent practicable, which is a recognition of the fact that you can't always avoid dividing those, those communities because of the, primarily the population balance reasons. Um, and so these traditional criteria might be something that help guide you in deciding which of those communities of interest to divide potentially or um, how to divide them. You know, do you divide them on an east-west axis? Do you divide them on a north-south axis? Um, and some examples, um, kind of a big one that historically has been used is minimizing the changes to the districts so that you minimize the impact on the voters. Because when you move voters from one district to another, sometimes it has the effect of moving them from one election cycle to another. And so you'll have some folks who will vote maybe twice in a row because they got moved. 
Um, but then you'll also have people potentially who will be moved um, from one election cycle to the other, which means they'll skip an election. So they'll, they'll vote and then they'll miss two election cycles before they get a chance to vote again. And so the courts and, and the legislature have historically said that trying to minimize that impact um, is a legitimate consideration. And again, I think that's something that can be taken into consideration as long as it doesn't result in a violation of those statutory criteria. Um, another example, sort of related, is um, avoiding head-to-head -head contests between incumbent members, which means just making sure that they stay within their current districts. Um, it, it's not it's not drawing districts, you know, so that you avoid competition. It's not you know drawing districts that necessarily are favorable, but it's avoiding moving them out of their district. Um, and you know, other things um, you might take into consideration as the, the statutes require cities and CDPs to not be divided, but there might be other things like school districts that you would take into account or. Um, you know, community service districts or, or other things that aren't listed in the statute, but you might want to uh, consider and that sort of thing. So that th there's still a role for, I think, for those traditional mm -hmm. criteria, but it's a much more subordinate role than it used to be. So there I'll uh, open it up to the question. Well, good. Thank you very much, Chris. That was um, really uh, good and um, interesting information. Um, so it sounds like we are still somewhat early in the process. You know, we have a pretty good idea of what the numbers are starting to look like for Marin County, um, but it's early in the process and we have to wait for the state to adjust that data that was just released by the federal government a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I do want to remind the public, I know we'll say it several times today, um, do check out our website, uh, www.redistrictmarin.org. Um, there's a lot of information already on uh, that website for the public to review, including um, anticipated uh, schedule going forward. Um, we do have a couple of um, formal um, hearings we're planning in October, probably a couple more in um, November or December. But um, with that, I think what I would like to do is turn to Anna Giles quickly to describe how the um, question and answer process will work in this morning's um, hybrid um, environment. So Anna, would you like to ex describe that for the public? Sure, thank you, Dan. As Dan mentioned earlier today, this is a hybrid meeting, so we do have some audience members watching via Zoom today, as well as members in the audience. Um, this is the first hybrid meeting that we get to have here at the county, so we're very excited about that. Um, and the way we're gonna move forward with questions is that we're going to go to the Zoom audience first and allow them to ask their questions, and then we will turn to our audience members here in person in the chambers for any additional questions. If you are tuning in via Zoom and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by using the raise hand function to let the moderator know you would like to speak. Or if you are calling in, you can uh, press star nine and that will also notify the moderator. Um, at this point, Al, do we have any speakers from Zoom that have questions? and you have the option to share video. Thank you. Um, this question, may, you may wanna hold this question until you get into talking about the mapping software, but uh, <clears throat> I was following along the PowerPoint and something struck me about the preliminary uh, census demographics that you showed in the PowerPoint. I've already created an account in Maptitude and the district estimated population and deviation in Maptitude does not match the preliminary census demographics on the PowerPoint. It's, it's significantly different if one was going to try to draw districts that roughly balanced as opposed to just looking at one small piece of it. Can you give us an idea of when Maptitude will be updated so that the, the numbers are similar? Yes, this is Kristen from NDC. So you are, you are correct that the online mapping tools are still populated with estimated uh, 2020 data based on uh, the American Community Survey and growth projections. So those tools will be updated um, they are run by uh, separate entities, so we don't have control over that ourselves, but 
we are expecting that data to be updated on Maptitude um, probably within the, the next week. Um, but certainly, that's something that we can uh, ask the county to uh, send out an announcement about once it's updated. And I want to say we do have the paper tools that have included the August 12th release of census data. So um, oddly enough, our, our most up-to-date population data are on our most analog tools. <laughs> Thank you. There are no additional speakers in the queue. Thank you, Al. Um, do we have any folks in the audience today that have questions? Um, if so, you can approach the podium and ask your question. And if not, we will move along to Kristen's presentation. OK. We will uh, have Chris Kristen transition down to um, the staff table, and she will give us a demonstration on how to use um, both online mapping tools as well as our paper tool. Thank you. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is exit out of the PowerPoint here. Awesome. OK, so we are going to start at redistrictmarin.org. This is your home base for all redistricting related information. This is the website that we've been plugging uh, all morning. And on this web page, you can navigate to draw a map. And this is where you're going to find all of the mapping tools available to the public. And I just want to say that why this is so important is because ideally the final map that we end up with will be a map created by members of the public in collaboration with the Board of Supervisors and NDC's role will not be to determine where district boundaries are but simply to help the public and the board to uh, create those maps using the technology available and ensuring that they're accurate. So uh, on this page, you're going to see two different online tools. District R is the first online tool. This is the simplest one. We also have a short demo video that you can watch on how to use this tool. I'm going to show you in just a moment. Maptitude is the more complicated advanced tool for power users that has much more data in it and allows you to do a little bit more. I will briefly show you how to use that, but we also have a YouTube demo on the website here as well. Then we also have paper only maps. Um, these, if you are tuning in online but you don't have access to a printer and you wanna use paper only maps, um, Definitely navigate to the contact us and you can contact the county administrator's office and they can get you paper maps. We have them printed here in the chamber today. Um, but these allow you to actually draw using your colored pencils or crayons or whatever. And this can be a really nice way to just get started um, on, on mapping. These paper-only maps will mimic what I'm going to show you in District R. And then there is also a Microsoft Excel supplement with population data, and this is the most recent release of population data. So for the online tools, you can submit any maps that you draw electronically. Um, for the paper maps, you can submit them by mail or in person. You can also take pictures of your paper maps and email those. So there's a lot of ways. We want you to have as, as many options as possible, whatever you're comfortable with, and please feel free to use all of them or none of them and even just draw your map on a napkin. <laughs> if, you, if you so choose, we, we will enter that into the public rec record. Um, so the first tool I'm going to show you is District R. So when you click the link here, it will take you to this webpage for Marin County. 
And this tool is created only in English, but I wanted to quickly show you if you are preferring to use another language, um, if you use Google Chrome and you use the Google Translate extension, you can use this tool in another language. So I just wanted to show that if you're translating your browser into Spanish, for instance, the entire tool will launch um, and, and, and it is able to be translated, uh, which is, I think, very helpful. So just wanted to show you that, but then I'm going to go back to the English version. Um, so on this page for District R, you're going to see two options. The purple box here is for drawing all five districts. I'm actually going to click on the red box here um, and demonstrate for interest or a neighborhood. Really the only difference between these two tools is that when you uh, are drawing the communities, you're allowed to draw overlapping communities um, because we recognize that, for instance, some homes are, you know, can be identified in two different neighborhoods or communities, so you could draw overlaps with this tool here. Okay, so um, uh, automatically you see the boundaries of the county here, and this is, again, an incredibly easy to use tool. You can zoom in and out, you can drag, click, and drag the map. So that functionality is quite easy. On the right side of the screen, um, you do have this button here with the hand. This is for when you want to click and drag the map. You have a paintbrush tool. This is how you're going to select the areas that you want to map. There's the eraser tool if you make a mistake. And then there's a search button here where um, Oh, a spotlight so that will pull up more information, I'll, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, I want to point out that you do not need to create an account or log in to use this tool or to save or submit maps on it. So let's say you want to draw an area that you think is important. We're going to click on the paintbrush. And the paintbrush can go from a very large size, and when you hover over, it will show you multiple blocks that it's going to select. Or you can make that paintbrush quite smaller, and it's going to just do individual blocks. Now, this is such a, a nice tool to use because if we're going to draw a community, you can actually click and drag, and it will select everything in its path, okay? Um, and then let's say I want to move my map a little bit, go back to my paintbrush, or you can just click piece by piece to select them. And as these, as these blocks I'm clicking turn blue, they are adding them to our map. And I'm filling in these blocks that are empty here, okay? And let's just point out that I am demoing a map here, so I am certainly not suggesting that this is anyone's community. Um, I am just drawing it randomly for demonstration purposes. So now that we're started drawing this community here in blue, what we're gonna want you to do is give it a name and describe it in some way. So today I'm going to call mine demo so that we know it's not a map that should actually be considered. Um, and we'll call it demo community of interest because we're not drawing a district, we're drawing community of interest. And so this automatically tells you here demo if I want to leave and come back to this, I can, um, and that it will show me all of the other titles of things that I'm working on in the drop-down menu. So if 
we want to see how big of a population I've included in this community, we can click on the evaluation tab and you can see that I have selected an area with 19,177 or 78 people um, in the county. And it also gives me some demographics about the area that I have selected in terms of the citizen voting age population for the area I've selected here. You can see that there are about 7.9% of uh, voting age citizens that are Latino in that area, which is pretty close to the county overall. And if you're looking at this and saying, why is this number here for Marin County less than the total population? That's because these are the voting age, right? So that's only citizens 18 and older. We are getting an IM. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So let's say I messed up. I want to erase some of this. Um, it's exactly the same as painting it. You can click and drag or you can select bit by bit, block by block. If you're going to use the, this same tool to draw all five supervisorial districts, it works exactly the same way. So once you have finished and you've created something that you like, and you've described it as why it's a community. You know, this is a, a demo community. Uh, what brings us all together in this demo community is that we're interested in redistricting and we're going to all become map nerds. And uh, so that's what's bringing us together today. So um, the other thing that you can choose to show under data layers are the current districts if you want to see right so it's pulling up those current boundaries and you can see I drew, have drawn a community here that crosses the boundaries of two different current districts um, there's also some other demographics uh, that you may be able to see There we go. So if we can want to look at um, some of these uh, data points that we have and use those to help guide the creation of our communities, we can. We can look at, for instance, if we want to look at the Latino population, then uh, citizen voting age Latino population, and then we see the shaded here on the map, so from lighter to the darker black here will be the percent of, of the uh, census block that is Latino. So there's some stuff you can see on here, um, though I do recommend primarily using this tool just for drawing. It's not quite as, as useful for looking at all of that information. Um, again, you can do un undo and it's actually undoing my drawing, as you can see. It's undoing my erasing. Let's save this. It's a one-click save, which is amazing. So once you click it, you will get this pop-up. And if you want to save that map as a work in progress, you can save it as a draft. And then when you come back to this website, uh, if you are on the same computer and same browser, it will pull it up um, and or it will allow you to select the, it by name. Um, one thing I suggest is to, to share it to the gallery because although they're giving you a URL that you can copy and share the map you're working on with friends um, or with the board of supervisors or anyone that you wish, if you click share now, it actually just publicly will share that map immediately. Um, if you don't share it and you just save it, then it will be submitting it to District R. And so um, 
no one else will will be able to access it without the URL. So if you click share now, then it will share it to a gallery and it will pop up for anyone else who might want to uh, modify your map or look at it and, and work from it. Um, of course, they will their changes, as it says here, if other people want to change your map, then their changes will be saved separately. So it's a one-click save. It says saved already, which is pretty great. I like this tool a lot. It's super easy. There's a little more in-depth demonstration here too on the website that you can watch. Um, but I want to show you the paper maps um, and particularly I want to show you how to use the paper maps with our Microsoft Excel supplement that will do population calculations for you um, without having <laughs> without having to use the calculator. So um, if you are looking at these total population number maps, right, they can be quite difficult to see things at the full county level and you would have to use a calculator if you're trying to draw a district and you want to add up the population of each of these geographic units. So what we have, which is quite nice, is this an Excel spreadsheet that goes with a, another PDF map, right? And this PDF map, instead of having a uh, population numbers. We don't want to look at that. We want to look at the population units. So what we see now is instead of the, the total population for each um, geographic unit here, we get an ID number instead. So it's a little bit easier to see. If And, th and this is a nice map if you are wanting to draw districts and you want to draw your district. You can draw just one district or you can draw all five. So if you are perhaps going to draw on this paper map, but you wanna see how many people are living in that area, we have this handy Excel spreadsheet. There's, but I'm just gonna show you how it works. ID number, which is in this column here. This is the ID number, right? Sign assign that ID number at population unit eight, we can assign that to a district, okay? So population unit eight, you wanna go back and see what which where that was, that was right here. And assign it to district four, which of course is just random. And then you can put in all of these, you know, let's assign everything. What if we assign everything here to District 4? Don't do this. You probably don't want to do this. Uh, <laughs> it's very important that I demo things that no one would ever want to do um, because otherwise if I demo something, it uh, it's a little bit too leading. Okay, so then once you fill this out for each of these population unit areas. So there's 72 of them. So you're basically taking little pieces of the county and you would be assigning them to districts. The wonderful thing about this Excel spreadsheet is when you click results, it's going to automatically <laughs> it's going to automatically update this spreadsheet to the demographic information. So you can see since I only assigned areas to district four, it's it's zeroed these um, one, two, three information for the areas I assigned to District 4. Uh, you can see I assigned 40,791 people. Uh, and, and you can see some of the citizen voting age demographics for Latinos, white, black, and Asian. So just a reminder, when you are building your uh, Mr. Skinnell's presentation, ideal district size that we're working 50, 51,700 
based on uh, the current data, again, we are going to have a few uh, adjustments made to the current data, but it will probably remain in that around 51, 52,000 as the ideal size for each of the Okay, let's look at Maptitude which is our more advanced tool. And then I'm going to take questions that you have about any of these tools or the mapping process in general. So Maptitude, that's the advanced tool. The advanced tool you do need to create an account to use. So it's, it's quite easy if you're a new user, you're gonna click new user, um, you simply put in a username, a password, and an email address, and you create an account, and then you can go to log in. So I have created an account here. Hopefully it logs me in if I type my password correctly. Okay, so the first thing it's going to show you is plan manager. And if you've created any plans, any maps, that a plan means map, it will save them here. I created one called demo, but it doesn't actually have anything in it, but we can open it. Um, or you can start with a blank map, okay? The way you create a new one is you can click new, and let's say you want to keep the existing districts on it as reference. So you click create. We'll leave it with the default name. And it takes a minute to load here, but you're already gonna see this is a, is a bit more of a complicated tool. There's more going on here. Um, I do want to highlight for you, there's options, districts. I wanna highlight for you the languages. So this tool is available in six languages. So you can select your language of choice. If I select Vietnamese, the entire tool will change to that language. So that is one of the advantages of using Maptitude. I also suggest that everyone start by clicking tips. language menu that you use to actually draw a district if you're trying to play with it only go to the top and click on tips that's super helpful so let's zoom out And the first thing I want to show you are um, the different layers that you can have on the map. Okay, so this is over here on the side, options, layers. So we'll click layers. And you can already see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, you can check and uncheck these things, right? Let's say maybe you don't want to see water. Okay, and it will remove that. What maybe you do want to see elementary schools. Okay, so you can click and see elementary school uh, areas on here. So there's a lot of options. And then themes are another thing you might want to look at on this map as a starting point. Um, you can look at different demographic information, just like we showed you in the other tool. It's, it's much easier here because it's just a drop-down menu. So perhaps we want to look at renters. All right. This is going to sh automatically shade in this map for us. And the legend, I don't know if you can see it here. It's a little bit hard to see, but what we get is a, is a heat map, Okay that is showing us the percent renters in each of these uh, 
block groups or whatever the population unit is going from you know cool to hot so you can see here there's more renters in this little spot so there's lots of different data that you can simply view in this tool which is a great way to start using it um, I'm gonna get rid of all that stuff so that we can actually start drawing on this tool so let's get rid of the elementary districts and so we're starting with the current ones. I'm going to click this grabber tool so that we can zoom in here. And you can zoom in by drawing a box or a rectangle or just clicking on the map, right? Um, and you do see the streets here, which is quite nice. Let's let me move, see if I can move this box. There we go. Okay, so toolbox is what you're going to actually use to draw using this tool. And there are different uh, ways that you can draw. Uh, you can draw by drawing a circle. You can draw another shape. Or you can simply click to select areas. And block is the smallest area you can select. Um, you can also select uh, block groups, which is larger, um, and tracks all the way up to place. So uh, let's go with block group and let's draw a shape and we're going to start drawing a district. And again, totally random. What you see here is it's, it's actually allowing me to create a shape and I just click for the points, okay? And now I have created a new district and it has taken the shape that I drew that looked kind of square and it has captured all of the census block groups within that area that I selected, right? And there's a, some very large census block groups over here, which is why it pulled in so much territory there. And so source means what am I starting from? So I was starting from everything. That's why it says all. But if I wanted to just, for instance, um, let's draw another district and I wanted to start just with uh, district three and I want to put it into a new district, I can do that. We can start with all again. We can put things into a new district a different way. Let's look at just doing the blocks and just selecting them. So you can see as I click on a, a census block, it will select it and add it. Now, we didn't save that last district that I drew. Um, so I'll have to show you how to do that, but let's, I'm just showing you how to draw it different ways. So it's, it's a more complicated tool. It's not that complicated. Um, and so hopefully you will enjoy playing with these, these tools. I really hope you turn into map nerds. So I'm not drawing probably anything large enough but let's stop let's stop here the way that you're going to say hey this is the district that I want is by clicking this check mark here and it's going to actually say cool with the map of five districts already it's gonna then be like hey now you're making six but that's okay And now it's created that new district for me. If you go to districts, it will show you uh, all of the data points for the current districts. And then if you go to demo, you can see I actually only selected 2,444 people. So this, this demo district is, is not nearly large enough, right? Um, 
When you do this, you are gonna probably wanna start with a blank map rather than having the district lines already here. Um, I kind of like to look at the district lines that are existing because I'm, you know, from my mind, you're thinking about how you might wanna change them. But um, you can also, if we, if we go back and uh, start this again, we can do a new plan from a blank map And it's really nice that, that all of this gets saved on your account and you can come back and work on it. And you can do all of that same stuff here. Um, if you want to submit a map that's one district or one community on here, that's great. You can do that. Um, or you can actually draw five districts. So very quickly, let's draw a district. And you can already see there's some real problems with what we've drawn, but let's save it. Okay. Up here, you can click Share Plan to share it. And it says a copy of your plan has been shared for other people. Now, I'm going to have to go in and delete this because no one should ever start with this one. Um, or you can click Submit, okay? Uh, and it's saying that it doesn't want to submit it because my district is just a mess. <laughs> um, let's see how much of a mess it is. Well, when you click on Plan Integrity, and I'm, again, I'm doing all of this for a reason. When you click on Plan Integrity, it's going to tell you have I created a district that doesn't even comply with the law because it's not contiguous? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, it's going to say, what? I only created one district, and I need to create five. So it's going to say, there's a lot of areas you haven't assigned to districts yet. Okay, And so it finds those for you. The reason I'm showing you this is because it can be really helpful, um, especially when you're working with such a large area like a county it can be very easy to, to miss certain blocks. So before you finish your plan, if you are drawing five districts, um, you do want to at least click five, cl uh, cl find unassigned areas before you submit so that you can submit something um, that is legally compliant. Um, this is a complicated tool. Again, go, the, the tips are very helpful. The help is very very good this is um, if you use this tool in the past the help is is far improved so that's something that I would direct you to um, and of course we're we're happy to help you uh, as you're using these tools um, I often say you know get started on the easy ones like district R and uh, if if you are ready to keep submitting maps and you want to submit multiple maps, um, maybe start by submitting a community of interest on District R. And then, um, you know, in a, in a few weeks, once we have our final or official California redistricting data, then maybe play with the more uh, advanced tool uh, once we have all of that f final data in it so that you can actually draw all five districts. So... I will pause here to take questions, but I will say you are very lucky to have um, an amazing staff for your county that has put together a great website and a variety of mapping tools that will empower the public to really drive this process. Thank you, Kristen, for that very detailed tutorial. I hope folks found that helpful. Um, this is a Q&A portion or a comment portion for folks who have questions about the mapping tool um, that Kristen just presented, very similar to the last round of Q&A. Um, because this is a hybrid meeting, we're going to start with any audience members that are tuning in through Zoom. Um, if you have a question and you're watching through Zoom, you can use the raise hand function to let the moderator know you'd like to speak, or if you are calling in, you can press star nine. Al, at this point, do we have any questions from those watching in, on Zoom?
And then finally, I'm wondering which mapping tool would you consider easier for the general public to use and which would, um, and is there another mapping tool that would be um, more aggressive to drill down to very specific details? And thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you for the question. I, I'm not sure I heard the whole thing, but um, definitely the easiest tool to use, I suggest start with District R. There's a reason why on draw a map, when you click that, it's the first one at the top. That's because this is the easiest one to use. So for the general public, most people will be able to use this tool uh, pretty easily. And you can actually use it to draw all five districts. I was demonstrating just the community one, but when you um, open it, you do have the option to click creating five districts. The more advanced tool is directly below it, Maptitude Online. It says here advanced tool. Yes, this is uh, the exact you know, this is the same tool that we, the demographers, are going to be using to to create maps. So, you know, it, for full access to the public, we're giving you the same tools we use ourselves. Um, and this does take you know, take time to learn how to use. Um, so certainly start with the simple tool. Vita, um, I believe we had some audio issues here in the chamber. So if there was a first part to your question, I, I believe we didn't hear that. If you would like to ask any follow-up questions that we didn't answer. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm since I'm on my cell phone, it may be difficult to hear. So I just wanted to clarify for the public that our redistricting is based on total population or is it based on 18 years or older voters? That is a great question. So redistricting is based on total population, which is every person residing in the county, no matter their age or their immigration status. Every person is required to be counted uh, by the United States Constitution. And those are the numbers that we use. So when we're talking about how many people uh, ideally we, we want to have in each district to meet that population equality requirement, we are talking about everyone. The reason that you saw me showing you data about citizen voting age population is because that is the way that we can ensure compliance with the Voting Rights Act because the Voting Rights Act is concerned with protected class uh, voters. So there's a reason why we show that data, but ultimately the, what determines the district population equality is that total population. So thank you. We do have another speaker. Uh, we have, and I'm sorry, I lost the name for a second. Mr. Scott McCowan, please unmute and you have the option to share video. Uh, it looks like Mr. Scott uh, McCowan um, lowered his hand, so he may no longer have a question. We have no additional speakers in the queue. Thank you, Al. Um, any of the members that are here in the chambers today, are there any questions um, that you'd like clarification on? Um, if you'd like to approach the podium so that way the microphone can pick up your audio for those tuning in through Zoom. Okay, we will do our best. All right, so uh, my first question deals with, uh, well, historically in Marin County, uh, set, uh, parcel lines have been used to define the uh, supervisorial district lines. And in parts of the county, most notably in the West End neighborhood in Center Fell, and in uh, Homestead Valley and Northern Nevada, uh, those parcel lines do not line up with census blocks. So my question is, what are NDC's capabilities for splitting census blocks in those areas? And if a member of the public intended to split census blocks for their district, how would they communicate that to NDC? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And you're absolutely correct that um, 
sometimes we have to uh, split census blocks. Um, ideally, we don't, but in this case that we do, um, what, what we actually do is we actually look at a satellite image and we count the rooftops of the buildings and we estimate, uh, you know, this looks like a single family home and we can estimate that X number of people live here. So we obviously do not want to do that unless it's, you know, very, very important. Um, uh, there, there is a situation I'm thinking of an example from another community where there's a census block that has um, a large hill, and at the top of the hill there's several houses, and at the at the bottom of the hill there's other houses, and of course there's a, a very very different um, characteristics of those of those residents, and so they they did want to split that block. So it is possible, and we do have capabilities to do so. If, if a member of the public wants to bring that to our attention, um, a great way to do that is to simply uh, send your email, uh, send an email here through the contact page. You can submit it there. You can email redistricting at marincounty.org, or you can uh, make a phone call to the county administrator's office. But... It's, it's important to also note that drawing maps is not the only way the public can participate in this process. Um, it's extremely valuable for you to also submit written correspondence or attend meetings and make public comments so that we can hear uh, from everyone. All right, my next question. Uh, I appreciate that the, uh, that the county and NDC has provided a variety of means for the public to submit maps. There are other platforms out there, including uh, Esri Redistricting, uh, Dave's Redistricting app, uh, the Districting Extension for QGIS. If a member of the public were to use one of those platforms to create a map, how would they communicate that to NDC? Yeah, so um, if you are using another platform to create a map, and you know, I always say we're in the Bay Area and folks are tech savvy here, so, um, you can share that with us ideally via email um it, even if you are sending us um you know esri files or anything like that we can we can um um find a way to make that work absolutely and and don't hesitate um if if you want i can give you my contact information and and you can communicate directly with me and finally from one from one map enthusiast to another, I just had a question on the uh, on the CVAP that is loaded in the mapping tool. Uh, is, is this 20, uh, 16, 20, or the, the 2019 five-year estimate CVAP? Correct, data? yes. And then I know that the statewide database normally disaggregates that to the block level, but they haven't published it for the 2020 census geographies yet. And I know that they published it for 2010 blocks. So my question is how has the uh, and it's and the Census Bureau only publishes at the block group level. So how has it been disaggregated to the block level for the 2020 geographies? Has it been converted from the 2010 geographies using area or disaggregated using the census uh, the, using the statewide database formula? How has that been done? So I'm not the person who's done that disaggregation. So I may have to get back to you on that. But um, I do believe that we are disaggregating, uh, based not using 2010, but using um, the fi the five year estimate that you're referring to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions or comments? In that case, I will hand it back to Dan for some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Anna, and thank you for members of the public. Um, we really appreciate all of this input. Um, again, it is early in the process. Um, we just wanted to make sure we provided an overview for members of the public uh, regarding these new online tools for those who are technologically savvy. Um, I do recommend, I think, as Kristen has already mentioned, District R. It's a, it's a much more intuitive platform. And for those who are interested in technology, that's probably the one to recommend. 
But for those who really want to dive in, as Kristen's talked about, um, the Maptitude program is pretty robust. Um, and um, if you want to take the time to learn how to use it, you know, that's an option as well. Um, I do just also want to underscore something that we have said. This is optional for members of the public. Um, the online mapping tools are not the only way for you to submit your um, information and your comments. So you can just submit a letter, submit an email. Um, if you just want to stay high level, we're accepting um, public comment in any and all forms because um, really it's the community that helps us define what our communities of interest are. Um, I also want to mention that um, the, we've had several members of our ad hoc advisory committee um, either in attendance or um, submitting um, comments today. So um, the board who created um, or authorized staff to create an ad hoc advisory committee to make sure we as staff and um, our consultants who we're working with um, really have some um, policy advice you know, as to how we proceed through this process to make sure we are doing um, aggressive outreach and um, we're certainly intending uh, to follow up on, you know, that advice. Um, we do intend to continue um, translating everything into Spanish and Vietnamese for any sort of public materials. And um, I just want to reiterate also, um, check out www.redistrictmarin.org. There's a wealth of information on that website. Um, links to the public mapping tools that we've talked about, links to the um, uh, paper mapping tools that you can download if that's your preferred alternative. But um, this really um, completes the formal part of our presentation today. It was intended to give you an overview. Again, it's early in the process. We're expecting at least four public hearings starting in October um, before we actually have to adopt a map um, or that we present to our Board of Supervisors no later than December 15th. And so um, let me just make sure there's nothing else I wanted to mention before we close. Um, again, um, you can sign up to receive email updates on our website. And we're at least at this time anticipating that our first formal public hearing with our Marin County Board of Supervisors will be on October 12th, shortly after the um, formal data is released by the state where they actually do their adjustments, including for San Quentin. So is there anything else from any of our um, panelists that we want to um, impart before we actually conclude the formal part of the hearing and transition into um, any on-site assistance that members of the public may request? No? no. Okay. Well, um, I, again, thank you very much. Um, so at this point, we are going to thank everyone on a Saturday morning who um, tuned in um, on Zoom remotely to um, check in. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, and received a lot of information with your Saturday morning cup of coffee. Um, go to our website for more information and this will conclude the Zoom portion of today's um, informal workshop and we are here to assist any members of the public who want some hands-on assistance. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend.